What's up, guys? Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad. I'm glad. Today's a Sunday live, so today we're just going to be diving into the uh, Word of God. Let me go ahead and turn, take off my hat because I'm going to be reading scripture. I don't want my head covered for that. Um, I need a haircut. I was at the barbershop today to take my oldest son, but Tuesday, Corbin is finally cutting his hair. So Tuesday, I'm going and I'm going to get a haircut with him. Uh, church was good today. Church was good today. We talked about Jonah. Um, Chad, crazy, man. It's crazy. Yeah, it's Jillian. It's he's got six years worth. Of, I mean, he's got his baby hair on his head still. He's never received a haircut, and he's getting tired of it. And honestly, it is rough for us to have to do it every time. So we're not. He's not going like me. He's gonna still have some on top. He's gonna do the sides, I believe. My my wife's the one in charge. So sides, and then leave a good amount on top. Do the Seahawks play? Oh, Seahawks, are you in Peter? No, I'm not in. Uh, I'm not up north. But uh, yeah, we lost today. Not happy about it. Hello from Finland. Ah, I wish I knew how to greet people in Finland. Would you recommend NLT or NIV for someone who has never read the Bible? No. I, if you really wanted to know my recommendations on your first Bible, it wouldn't be start with those. It would be start with something that's easier than the King James, obviously, but um, not something like that. So if you need something that's really simple, uh, like those are, and, and but stays pretty true to the word. Well, not pretty true. I don't want you to think that Bibles don't stay true. Pretty true as far as word for word. I would say the CSB is a good one. Amplified is a good one, but I prefer the ESV. It's a little bit more as far as like dealing with the uh, the grammar sometimes, but it's not as hard to understand as you would think it is. Um, I think ESV did a great job with uh, with how they did the English um, compared to like NASB. Um, so today, guys, I want to read a couple scriptures because I want to talk about the gospel. What song is playing? Uh, Used to do it featuring KB. It's an old Lecrae song. Um, lately the gospel has been the thing that, you know, hmm, we've been talking about a lot as we should be. We should be talking about the gospel all the time. Um, but I've been show, I, I've tr been trying to show you guys that whenever there's false teachers, it's the gospel. That's what we look to. We look to the gospel. I'm not saying anything's wrong with the NIV. Someone asked for my opinion, right? You, I mean, are there things wrong with the NIV? Yeah, absolutely. But like, it still has the gospel message and no English Bible is perfect. No English Bible is perfect, right? Um, but um, some are better than others because of the translators and how they did it. So I'm just saying, I would never use the NIV for deep study. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it. Like me, I use, I use logos, so I actually read multiple translations it's it, i have all, all the different translations up on screen so i can compare how the uh, how they translated it and then i look at the original language you don't have to do all that by the way i'm not saying that um again <laughs> if you're just reading it to read it read the one that you're going to read every day i want people to understand that i'm not i'm not that, that person that tells you what you have to read but if you ask me mike what's your opinion i'm going to tell you which ones i prefer because i was asked right um Olive Tree, I've seen Olive Tree app. Um, I never really played with the Olive Tree app uh, because then I went into Logos, uh, but I have seen the Olive Tree app. Uh, yes, I do have a video. I have a 45 minute tutorial on how to use Logos like me for absolutely free 99, free, free 99. Um, I know Jillian, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. But uh, I saw a question that actually caught my eye. When you were asking those in live lives what the name of God is, were you looking for God of Israel? I mean, they could have said Jesus, Jesus, or Jesus. They could have said Yeshua. They could have said Yahweh, Yehovah. They could have said, uh, uh, heck, even if they said Elohim, even though it's not his name, I would have at least known who they're talking about. So I've, me, and, me and JD have talked about this before. Don't get excited because someone says, I love God or I know God, right? We have a problem in, 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 in America, especially. If someone says God, we just assume we're talking about the same God. Someone to get on TV and be like, God bless you. I'm like, oh, look, yo, hey, hey, someone talk about God. Yeah, man, Jesus is king. Like, yeah, but he wasn't talking about your God. Like, that's a serious question. There's many gods. And only one real God, but there's many gods, right? Who, who are you talking about? And so I saw that person's page where, you know, their profile said like something divine, uh, something divine of God, spiritualist. And it's like, yeah, you're not talking about, we're not talking about the same God. Has anyone ever said you look like Jonah Hill? Uh, never until yesterday. And now that you're the second person. Very weird. Like 
but yeah, like I was saying, I was just giving my my opinion on what I would read. But back to the story at hand, um, story at hand, the topic at hand. I want to talk about the gospel today. I want to talk about the gospel today because I keep telling you guys that the best way for you to identify whether someone is of the truth or not, it's the gospel because that is what matters. That like, let me tell you this right now. When you get to heaven, there's going to be people in there that disagree about everything, but there will be one thing that everybody that walks through the gates of heaven will be able to say that we all know, and that's the gospel, because it's the gospel that saves. I don't fully trust you. What is your denomination? Well, Mel Noyce, I'm not asking you to fully trust me, so thanks so much for letting me know. Yahweh is an Elohim, but not all Elohims are Yahweh. Absolutely, Jillian. Um, yeah, so FYI, not asking any of you to trust me. Not here to be your leader. I'm here to be a Christian who is walking with the Lord and you can watch me and join me with the walk and we can walk side by side. I don't want to lead you. I want to walk with you. That's it. That's it. I'm here to glorify my father in heaven and point at, at, at the almighty son of God, point to Jesus and say, go to him. You want to know how you can never work? You, look, I'm telling you guys all the time. If you want to be, know how to, to serve God and not fail, always point at him. Always point at him. Like never make it about you. Just point at him. Do you believe in the Holy Trinity? Absolutely. Absolutely. The study I did on Christmas. Are you talking about like why Christmas isn't a pagan holiday? Don't worry. We'll be getting all into that here in a little bit. Um, how many books in the Bible? 66. 66 divinely inspired word uh, 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 books. But ready for this? I already know the, the, uh, the, the arguments are coming. Today's my Sunday uh, Sunday live stream. Sunday live streams are not for debates. I, I know I got to say this every day that I go live. So to my normal followers, I apologize that I have to say this every day. Just because you think you're entitled to debate me doesn't mean you are. I don't know why all these, it's usually Catholics, but there's a bunch of people that like don't have a platform and they're just this random person. I'm supposed to stop out of 257 people in here and be like, oh, you're here, my Lord. Would you like to debate me? No, you haven't. Like, I'm not trying to boast in who I am. I'm saying, though, why would I just randomly identify you and give you this time out of my day when other people want to read scripture? So just same thing I said every time. Not here for your entertainment. I'm not here for you to trust me. People, anyone who has to ask you to trust them obviously doesn't believe that they're doing something right. I don't I don't ask nobody to trust me because the word of God says if you speak his words, we hear each other. First John chapter four says that we hear each other because we are of God and the world hears the world because they are of the world. So I just speak and people that I expect to hear me will hear me. <laughs> I don't know why y'all tripping. So let's let's start with first Corinthians. Um, no, you know what? Let's start with Galatians. So I've been talking to y'all about the gospel. There's this moment in Galatians where it starts off immediately with, with a rebuke, but I want to point something out interesting as well. Nobody ever reads the intro to Galatians when they're talking about this rebuke. Paul doesn't just jump in and rebuke people. And what do I mean by that? There's a lot of heretic hunters out here that they want to just rebuke everybody. And by not having an introduction and saying hello or like at all, like I get it. If someone's straight up a false teacher and they're uh, clearly a satanic looking dude, <laughs> like I get that. But like, if it's just another Christian and you think they might have something wrong, jumping in and just being like, you're wrong, ah, 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 is not how at all how Paul did it. Because they'll always be like, well, Paul rebuked people. Listen to how Paul opens his letter. Before this harsh rebuke comes, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of, God, of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's a soft intro before diving into the rebuke. And I think this is a small thing that we need to remember, that these letters don't start with rebuke. So your conversation shouldn't start that way with brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ. If you can't, notice how the common ground is brought up first. Paul didn't jump into the, you might be believing other gospels first. Common ground. Hey, we all, we follow him, right? Peace and grace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, me and JD were talking about this on the podcast the other day. Um, and we were saying like, actually on the Bible reading the other day. And um, we were mentioning how this is kind of like a rebuke to myself. But I feel like every time Paul 
and, and these uh, epistles start and close. It's always God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's never just one. Like they always are trying to remind you of peace and blessing to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's never just Jesus. It's never just the Father, right? And Jesus never let us have that. Jesus never let it just be Jesus. In fact, he literally, no, the Father, no, the Father, no, the Father. And the Father points at the Son and the Holy Spirit points at the Son who points at the Father. It is a beautiful thing and we cannot and we should not fall into just Jesus and not the Father and not remembering who he is and and glorifying him because Jesus isn't the end. He's the mediator between us and the Father. It's not just get to Jesus. He's the mediator. So I got to get to Jesus because he mediates to the Father. Just a reminder there as well. Just like we're praying, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. That means that our prayers are going to the Father. But it it is because we are in Christ that our prayers can even come before the Father. So our prayers go through him. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that our prayers reach him. All right. So it's a beautiful thing. And then he jumps into it. Verse six. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, and now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So Paul says this back to back. And if you've read any of Paul's epistles, this is not a normal occurrence that Paul does, where he literally rewrites the exact same statement back to back. Like he might, uh, you know, mention something he said prior and, and use the same wording, but back to back, this is one he wants to make very, very clear. And what is it? If anyone even we or an angel. Notice we, meaning an apostle or an angel. So a heavenly body, none of them can contradict the gospel. I don't care if you've had visions. I don't care if they did miracles. I don't care what they did. The gospel is secure. And this is what should give us peace. We should know like, yo, no matter what people say, like I know the gospel. And it says, let them be accursed. And you might say, okay, well, what is that word accursed? It means just a cursed thing. So basically, um, let them be cursed from God. God, they obviously have a punishment. They're like, God is going to take care of them. Let them be in their own, let them stand in that target. Let them go. Let them be what they are. Let them be a curse. Like that's them, but stay away from them. It's loud. Let stay away from them. If anyone, I don't care what kind of credibility they try and say, but like, this is the starting ground. People talk about what's the litmus test, right? If you're trying to figure out if someone's trustworthy or not, the gospel, do they preach the gospel? And we're going to talk about the gospel. Matter of fact, let's talk about it now, then we'll come back to it later. So what is the gospel? So that word gospel, I'm going to see if I can read the Greek to you too, so I can show you uh, where this word comes from to understand it a little bit better. We see, we hear that word gospel so much, but how many people um, have taken the time to find out what it means? So in Greek, it's euangelion, um, which you may be like, that sounds familiar because you'll hear stuff like um, the very first proto-evangelium, uh, James's, uh, the, the eugelium of James, right? So uh, this is the Greek word for gospel. And that word, let me see if the dictionary reads it the same way I would say. It. It's just good news, but let me see what the Greek dictionary actually has uh, for its meaning, just to see if it varies a little bit. You want me to, actually, I should probably flip the camera around. Y'all just staring at me read scripture. Let's, 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 uh, let's read scripture together. Yeah, y'all not stare at Mike because that's just weird. Let me uh, let me shrink it down so it fits for you. If y'all gonna read scripture with me, we gonna read scripture together. I hate that I have to make it so small for y'all to see it, but whatever. All right, I hope that's helpful, guys. Let me make this a little bigger so you can see what we're doing. All right, so that eugelion, let me see if I can get, here we go. So here's the definition. This is a pocket lexicon for the Greek New Testament down here. And I'm looking at that word um, gospel, which I just had in front of us, but then I made the screen smaller. There it is, eugelion, euangelion. And that word is the good news of the coming of the Messiah, the gospel in general, after it expresses sometimes the giver, God, sometimes the subject, the Messiah, sometimes the human transmitter and, and apostle. Um, so there it is, the good news of the coming Messiah, right? So 
people have asked, what did they do before Jesus came? Who, what did they believe in? So if we go to Romans real quick, let's go to Romans 4. I believe that's going to be where we're at. It might be 3. Let me see. No, it's 4. If we read in Romans 4, it tells us that with, with, with Abraham, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So Jesus was the promise, the promise of the gospel, the promise of the good news, right? And we know this because uh, all throughout the, into- the Old Testament, we see this revelation constantly being given and like it's a promise, it's a covenant. Um, so he trusted that the promise will come. We trust in the promise that has come, has come. Notice the difference there. But you, they were saved in the Old Testament by trusting in the promise to come. And we know that in Romans 3, he tells us that God looked over these old sins. Right here, it says, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, He was not unjust by overlooking Adam's sin because he knew Christ would come and be on the cross. That's why Jesus is the lamb slain since eternity passed. So even though Adam sins and Jesus didn't die on the cross yet, God's divine forbearance, knowing what will happen, he passed over these sins because he would be the just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So that is... uh, uh, um, what they used to believe in. Now, what is the gospel today? What is what is the good news? And that good news is that Christ came into the flesh, fully man, fully God, walked this earth for 30 years, preached his own death, burial, and resurrection. Then he did. He went to the cross, died on the cross, rose from the grave so that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. All that believe in him do not uh, uh, see judgment, but pass from death to life. And there's certain things that make the, uh, that you also, uh, how do I want to word this? There's certain things that might not be said during the gospel that you need to verify if you're checking with someone. Because you see what I just said? A Mormon can say those words as well. We got to make sure that the, the small things I noticed, I mean, I said, did you notice me say that he is fully God, fully man, came in the flesh, right? We even see this with John. When John tells you to test the spirits, pay attention to John's wording. He says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. But this, you, by this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Notice this distinction that Jesus came in the flesh, meaning that's not his normal existence, right? There's, there's a difference between that Jesus Christ, you know, was a man and he was a good man and he lived. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We, we have to know who Jesus is. That's why it's important to ask people, you know, if you're in these deeper conversations, obviously not in passing, you're just not gonna stop someone and be like, oh, what is this? Ah. Um, and if you ever need something to look at quickly to know the gospel, right? Um, you've probably heard it before. This is a quick summary of it. First Corinthians 15 says, now I would remind you brothers of the gospel I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And I love the fact that Paul always writes so well, obviously divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Notice that unless you believed in vain. We often talk about, Mike, do you, are you saying no, that people can't lose their salvation? What about the people that walk away? Unless you believed in vain. What is that word vain? Let's open it up. Paul used the word Ike here. And I wish my dictionary decided to load at the normal speed. All right, so since it's not loading on that speed, speed, I'll go over here. Uh, No purpose. Believed with no purpose. Believed with no purpose. In English, how we use the word vain, we could also say it's synonymous with shallow, right? It's a shallow uh, belief. People that did not believe for the right purposes. And we know that that's possible. Jesus tells us this in the parable of the sower, uh, Matthew 13. And also, if this is your first time joining us, this is how I study the Bible. I jump around to the things that I know are being referenced between Paul and Jesus, right? So when Paul talks about a a vain belief, we can come right here to uh, the parable of the sower explained. And it says, as for the one that is sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives with joy. How many people you know like that? 
They hear the word, oh, what? I love Jesus. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. That's why people leave. Now I ask you, does Jesus give you any reason to believe that this was a saved believer? He says he has no root in him. Yes, he rejoices. Yes, he jumps up and down because he heard this word and there was something about the word that he wanted. Heck, maybe he just doesn't want to go to hell. Self-preservation. Maybe he wants blessings. Maybe he wants comfort. Maybe he wants to use God as a genie. He's got these good feelings inside him. Maybe he just really enjoys the community, the people that have introduced him to the church and he just wants to be a part of that church community. But at the end of the day, this is why, and people get so mad at people like myself and Justin because you got Christians that are minding their own business, having fun with their little barbecues, and everybody's happy, and people's lives are really good. And when you say, hey, you're not preaching the gospel, they go, you're just a rude, judgmental Christian, mind your business. But the thing is, if y'all are over there, and the main thing that this church is doing is eating hot dogs and, and playing games, we got to make sure that people understand who Christ is. We must know why they, like, are you pursuing Christ for the right reason? Because some don't have a root in himself and they endure for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, when a moment comes up where you have to choose between God and the world, your sin and the world, or I mean your sin and Jesus, suddenly people say, I can't get down with that. And then they say that they're a deconstructed Christian. They're an ex-Christian. No, 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 no. You just didn't have your faith tested for a while. You were just walking around. Let's go back to Galatians. Oh, so, so yes, so the gospel, here it goes. He continues. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and to the 12, Cephas is Peter. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Listen to what he says here too. That when people talk about what evidence do you have, Paul is writing this saying, we've seen him risen. All these people did and some of those are still alive. If someone wanted to prove it wrong, all they have to do is go into the towns and be like, hey, is this true? And everybody would be like, nope, never heard of it. Nope, 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 nope. But they couldn't. They couldn't disprove this because this was eyewitnesses that have seen it. So here's the summary of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, buried and raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And I love the fact that Paul also writes according to the scriptures because there are some groups out here like the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church that'll say, well, how would you even you know, have the scriptures of the Bible without us? Catholic Church doesn't exist yet when this is being written. But yet Paul is able to say that we believe in Christ's crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, according to what? The scriptures. That's why when, when Jesus rises from the grave, What's the first thing he does? Anybody know? I'll show you. He's sitting there talking to them, right? He says, uh, what is this conversation that y'all are having? And they're confused who it is because they don't know it's Jesus yet. And then he says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, all the things concerning himself. Jesus's first act of resurrection life was to declare to them what the scriptures said about him and, and pointed out as clear as day what the scriptures say about him dying and raising from the grave and being glorified. First act he did. What is, the, what is uh, with, beginning with Moses? That's the Torah. Well, that's the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the law, right? And then all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all that. A little bit more. When he gets with the rest of them, what happens? Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is why church fathers like Augustine said that Jesus knew that we would not always have the ability to put our hands on him or touch the hole on his side or the hole in his hands, but he knew we would always have the scriptures. This is why he told Thomas, you see, I mean, you believe because you see, blessed are those who will believe without seeing. This is why we stick to the scriptures.
So that is the gospel, right? And there's small little details about that to, that it's important that are important for us to look at and study and get to know, but this is the gospel. This is the gospel. And that's so important that, oh, wow, I got it open in two places. Let's go to uh, Galatians. Here we go. Why Galatians 1? I don't want Galatians 1. I mean, Galatians 6, I want Galatians 1. Hold on, sorry, guys. So this is why we can understand why Paul's being, so, I mean, he's so serious right here. Like, guys, do not believe another gospel. This is the gospel. And then listen to what he says at the end of it. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? I like that. Because this next one, or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You better get that in your mind right now, especially in today's technology, when you could be seen by the whole world. It's easy to go and preach before 30, 40 people. This new technology age, a lot of Christians are going through doubt and pain because they thought they could step up here and not realize that <laughs> it's a lot different when millions of people can see you and they're going to hate you. They're going to despise you. They're going to try and tell you that you're wrong. You need to know this if you're someone who aspires to talk about the gospel one day. And, and know that it's a process. This is why me and JD are so tight about, guys, take your time and don't rush. Your time will come to stand before others and speak and to stand before others and teach because we need people in every generation. But when people rush, they jump up and then they still care about what man thinks. They're still seeking man's approval and they don't realize it yet. This is what anxiety is. Anxiety is the fear of man. But we're told that the all knowledge and wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. So who do we fear more, the Lord or man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And then Paul goes into his resume. And this is one thing I think is also beautiful to think about because there's a lot of people who demand you to just hear them as authority. Now, I'm not talking about the people that are just, just sharing the word and, and, and evangelizing. I'm not talking about Justin and them, right? Because they just, Justin's just an evangelist. People that try and claim he thinks he wants authority or myself or JD, we don't. We're talking about these people out here that claim to be apostles, prophets, Watch what an apostle does. He shows up and he has to make it clear where he gets the gospel from. Who is he? What's his resume? And he says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach uh, him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Now, before we go into the next chapter, a lot got covered there. And it kind of is funny. I, I forgot about this kind of this section right here, but it confirms what I just was talking about. Take your time, brothers. Paul literally got knocked off his high horse by Jesus and sent on a mission. But what did he say he did? He did not immediately do so. He went away for three years. I always found this to be interesting. Where is it at? He just kind of like subtly just glosses over this fact. He says, after three years. And I can't help but think about the correlation between the apostles and him. Jesus made his, his original 12 walk with him for three years. I wonder if he made Paul spend three years with him. I wonder if Paul spent three years with Christ. The risen Christ, spending time with him, learning from him. And this is also a testament to the fact that, guys, I know that when we read the Bible, we can think like, oh, this happened right away. But sometimes in a, in a, in a matter of a few words, years pass. Ready? Ready for this? And returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, that quickly, three years passes. And yet we can get so impatient 
because we think, well, the Lord has called me and now I must step up. I must lead. I have to do all this. And I don't think I'm ready for all this yet. But in the Bible, I see it. You know, Paul gets it. Slow down. Take your time. God is not depending on you. When God calls you to ministry, he's not like, yo, Steve, if you don't start preaching the gospel, I'm in trouble. You are one of many that he will move and you need sleep and you need the same amount of time that everybody needs for rest. You got the same 24 hours in a day that he gave Isaiah, that he gave Moses, that he gave Noah. He's not expecting you to move mountains more than anyone else. When you rush, it's when you mislead people by accident with good intention. And honestly, it makes me feel terrible that I have to call people out sometimes on this app that I can see are truly in their heart. There's some good intention. And people say, well, then why don't you message them privately? Because the people listening to them now need to know. A private message ain't going to help nobody right now. And if it gets met with pride, it continues to help nobody right now. And then he goes on to talk about going forth. And meeting the apostles. And I want to start here. He jumps 14 years now. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles. In order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So here, 14 years later, Paul's still checking. But yet there's people out here that came to Jesus four months ago, claiming to be a prophet. And if you say a word about them, they, can, they tell you, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You're going to hell. Y'all saw last night, asked the young lady what the gospel is. She said, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You have your salvation stripped from you if you even had it in the first place. Oh my God, have mercy. God have mercy. Whew, how dare you speak for the Lord like that? Even when Satan was contending with, I mean, uh, uh, when Michael the archangel was contending with Satan, Michael did not speak a blasphemous judgment, but rather said, the Lord rebuke you. Oh my goodness, these people and the authority they think they have. And, 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 and notice what Paul also says right here. <laughs> I, love, I love this. This is one of my little favorite lines that he, that he mentions in here. Um, where is it at? Did I read it already or is it down a little bit lower? Oh, it's down a little bit lower. Never mind, never mind, never mind. We'll get there. But he's, he's hinting at it because he said these people who seemed to be influential. He said the gospel that I proclaimed. As a matter of fact, I want to stop for a second and ask you guys a question. Let me flip the camera because this is another one that's, that's really cool to think about. We always want to act like we know better, right? And we don't really say it out loud because we love God. But oftentimes we do think we know better and we'll say things. Hey, buddy. You shocked me a little bit. You hit that door hard. Hey, no, 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 no. Hey, no. Look at me. Put it away. Correctly. Put it away correctly. What are you doing? Can I put this inside? Yeah, of course you put that inside and then put it away correctly. Boy, that's a mess. Oh, big head. Oh, you are. I know. I gave you a big head. It's my big head that you got. You took my big head. Sure. I love you. Can I have a hug? Can I have a kiss? Okay, right on the cheek. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Oh, oh, oh. I love you, buddy. My nose has been hit a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Can you close my door, please? Thank you, buddy. I love you. Oop. Oh, there you go. So, the question I had for you guys. We always think that we somehow know better than God in the moments of our weakness. And we always, uh, I mean, this is what happened with Abraham and Sarah, right? They were like, well, God promised us a kid, but we're just going to do it this way. So here's a question I have for you. If you were God and you had to decide which one of these two to send to the Jews and Gentiles, you have Peter, the fisherman, Peter, the, he's not a Pharisee. He didn't study the Jewish uh, traditions. He doesn't understand, you know, as much as, 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 as Paul does. And then you have Paul who just explained how he was so advanced in all these things. And I think it's so crazy that God sends Paul to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. And it just reminds me that he knows so much better than us. Because you and I, don't lie. Look at me. Do not lie. You're sending Paul to the Jews. You know you are. The only reason you would say you're not is if you're lying and pretending that, you don't, that, that you, uh, you know, you're being unbiased here. If you had those two people in front of you, 
And the Lord was like, hey, Mike, what do you think? And I'm looking at him like, well, I mean, this guy Paul here got a lot of respect, uh, knows the tour back and forth. I mean, I'll, I think it's a safe bet. And then Peter, fisherman. So that means he's dealt with Gentiles because that's a trade business and Gentiles trade. So, I mean, and obviously he's not really that deep into the Jewish thing. So Peter to the Gentiles? No. God always going to show you, I got this. I love, <laughs> I love you, God. <laughs> Let's get back into it. Listen to what he says. I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. There's that word vain again. Why is vain so important? I believe in the scriptures because what matters the most is what we do and I mean why we do things. And vain is a lack of a why, right? This is even in the first, one of the very beginning commandments. What do we hear? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Well, that's not about speaking either. Don't let anybody tell you that by saying God, you're committing, you know, you're breaking the Ten Commandments. Now, if you say it for a wrong reason, are you sinning against God by disrespecting His name? Absolutely. But just saying God is not breaking that commandment. First of all, His name's not God. Second of all, that's not taking a name. That's speaking a name. If it was a name, right? If I step outside and I see a beautiful sunset and I say, "Oh my God, look at that sunset," why would that be wrong? My God created that sunset. Now, taking a name in vain is this. When you marry, when my wife married me, she took my name. You, you getting where I'm going with this yet? Every time that you claim to belong to God, you walk outside representing his people. And if you don't walk that way, you are doing so in vain. When the Jews would be uh, would do the things of the pagans, they took his name in vain because they were his chosen people, but then would do the things of the pagans. When you step out into this world and demonstrate a worldly uh, life, you take his name in vain. I'm not saying when you sin, we all sin. Remember I told you, not the what, it's the why. We all sin, the why. What are you doing? Do you represent your father's name? You have your father's name. Represent it well. I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Now, you might be wondering, that comes out of nowhere. What's that about? So in case you don't know, in uh, the city of Galatia right now, there are, there's, dis, there's uh, divisions coming up of people preaching that you have to be circumcised, even if you're a Gentile. And this is a false gospel. This is why um, Paul starts this letter off the way he does. Now, Peter's not preaching that. However, Peter is giving special treatment to the circumcised Jews over the Gentiles. And by his actions alone, he is making people believe that that's, a, that's, a, that's an okay thing, right? Um, for example, he, wouldn't sit, he would sit with someone, obviously, if they're a Gentile, but when it was between sitting with Gentiles and Jews, he sat with the Jews. And this is important for you to understand that for what's going to happen here in a little bit. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, slavery of the law, slavery of the law, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. I love that verse. When people try to tote some type of authority, when people try to say, oh, I, I, it's one of the things that I pull with Catholics. And I love my Catholic brothers to death. Love you guys. But some of them uh, Catholics out there need to get rebuked. We try and pull some type of authority. Look, they might seem influential, but what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he had, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me, for mine to the Gentiles. It's a tongue full there, mouthful. I want to show you something here. This is not two different gospels. Some people will try and say like, oh, look, Peter had the gospel to, the, to them and Paul, Paul had the gospel to them. No, it's saying that I've been entrusted with the gospel to go here. It's about the word you're going with the gospel. Same gospel, two directions, two paths. Because when Paul came across Jews, 
he preached to Jews. When Peter came across Gentiles, he preached to the Gentiles. How do we know this? In Acts chapter 10, the first Gentiles to be saved, that was Peter preaching to them. Uh, uh, the Jewish uh, people in Acts 19 or the Jews in Acts 26, uh, uh, I mean, Jews all over, that's, that's Paul talking to them. So it's not an individual gospel specifically for, it's just saying that Paul was sent to the Gentiles and Peter was sent to the Jews. Now, you may have heard people say, the church is the pillar of faith. It's a quote from uh, Timothy's letters. This is a spot that I like to point out to remind people that the people are the church because Paul makes it clear when he says, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, that's an interesting word. It's only used four times in the Greek, four times in the Greek. Ready? Tell me right now what you think pillar means. I'm going to show you the four times it's been used. You tell me if you think it's a building or if it's a people. The first time it's used, it's the Greek word right here, by the way, in case you're wondering. It's used in the verse we just read, that when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars. So in this verse, three men are pillars. First Timothy, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Okay, so the church is a pillar. Revelation 3.12, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And then in Revelation 10.1, it says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of flame. So that pillar is not in the same context. So now we have three in the context of the church. Three men are a pillar. He will make him a pillar. And then the church is of the living God is a pillar. Maybe it's because the people, the people. Just want to throw it out there because people love to cherry pick. Well, we have to, you have to obey my church because the church is the pillar of truth. What? We are the church and we are the pillar. And when the these pillars right here perceived the grace that was given to Paul, given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they ask and they and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But and here's an interesting thing. This is not really a separation. Paul's writing in, in fluid motion here. This is a letter. All right, we can sometimes think, all right, I'm done that passage. I'm gonna take a break. I'll come back later. Or, uh, and, and you could do that, but just want you to understand. And our Bibles add like this little title here to help you know kind of what you're going into. But, but means we're just literally going, we're, but, see, it's, that's not how it works. This is a letter that we're reading through. So he just ran into these guys. He just talked about a minute ago, what, what? About how Titus didn't have to get circumcised, right? So he's still in this train of thought. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. And this word for opposed is the same as rebuke, right? Um, when Cephas came to Antioch, I rebuked him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing their circumcision party. So Peter, in action, almost led people to think, of a different gospel. I want you to understand what's being said right here. Catholics have dogmas that they've created 1,500 years after Christ. Okay? I can prove this because in 1950, the assumption of Mary was made a dogma, meaning I have to believe that in order to be a part of their church. I have to. I have to. I have to. Why is it that even when Peter led people to believe, now he didn't even say it, but led people to believe circumcision was necessary, Paul rebuked him to his face and said, you stand condemned. Boy, stop it. I want you to think about that. I don't want to tell you what to think about that. But a, a real person who's not just going to blindly side with anybody, if you love truth, if you love Jesus, answer that question in truth and with Jesus. Don't answer it with opinion and emotions. Ask yourself. If it's that serious that just sitting with certain people and making people believe that they need to be circumcised to be a, a, a part of the kingdom and part of the body of Christ, if that's enough for Paul to rebuke one of the apostles who walked with Jesus to his face and write a letter saying, I am just astonished that you guys don't understand how to follow the gospel. If anyone, we, why do you think Paul adds we? Clearly, he's implying because Peter's an apostle. 
We or an angel, anybody, don't matter who. But yet, and I'm, I'm not trying to make Catholics feel bad. Someone asked me earlier, are you against the Catholic Church? I'm like, sure, but I'm not against Catholics. I love you. But man, how can you be okay with, even if, even if they truly are the apostolic succession and that's Peter's successor and he's saying that this is something that we've all believed, it doesn't mean it's a dogma. There's a big distinction between a dogma and what we all believe. You can all believe whatever you want, but when you make it, you have to believe this. You now stepped into the grounds of blasphemy and you're, and you're changing the gospel. Because again, I want you to think about something. According to the Catholic rules, I cannot become a member of their church unless I accept all of their dogmas. You cannot deny a dogma. In fact, and I've said this before, in the 1950s, when Pope Pius XII announced the dogma, which was the Assumption of Mary, he said, whoever does not believe this has fallen away from the faith and stands condemned. So 1900 years after Christ, if someone does not believe that Mary at the end of her life assumed into heaven with her body, I can't be a part of the one true church that Jesus established. Think about that. Let's keep going. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith, in Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and just, if you're with me, let's just, let's just highlight that. That's a good highlight to have. Oops, you know what, I, I like that. Let's go ahead and do all that. Matter of fact, let's even throw the we know that. All right, let's just throw it all in there. I'm getting ex excessive with it. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ. Look at it. He just banging this one out like a constant reminder. He hits you three times with the same thing, basically. This is what he's saying. <laughs> Stop this nonsense because we know that no one's justified by works of the law. It's through faith in Jesus. And we also believe in Jesus. That's we doing that in order to be justified by the faith in Jesus and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild when what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If you ain't got that, if you don't have this right here uh, highlighted, go ahead and highlight it three times. This is one of those people talk about verses you should know. I feel like this is one you should just want to know. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You don't need to, I don't care about this thing right here. This verse number, because if this is where you struggle, Mike, I struggle with, remember Galatians chapter two, verse 20. I don't care about those. Those aren't the word of God. The word of God is not verse 20. The word of God is not chapter two. The word of God is not Galatians. The word of God is, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And if you want to say, if you want to say that, all you have to do is say, thus says the Lord, or it is written, declare his word. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. That's another banger right there. If you run into people that want to preach this law that you have to keep, you got to do this, you got to do this. Don't you know God expects you to do the commandments? God's telling you to do the commandments. You got to do the commandments. You got to do the commandments. You got to do the commandments. If righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. 
and, and, and we don't have time to, to do it, but I recommend if you're struggling with then why was the law given? I have done this before. It's probably on my YouTube, to be honest, but I would recommend right here reading from Galatians 3.15. We'll just keep reading Galatians. And he talks about why the law. The law was given as a guardian between the promise of Abraham and the coming of the promise. Christ was the promised offspring and he came. Between that period is the law. And as it says here, uh, the law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God. Now, the reason I'm, I'm not going into this is because I wanted to jump real quick back to Romans. Because Paul writes Romans and he writes Galatians. Paul goes into depth with teaching uh, the doctrine of salvation in Romans. Let me drink some water. Hold on. Let me tell you what the goal is for reading this right here. There's 334 of you in here. That means I don't doubt that one of you has been really in fear of their salvation, saying, do I really believe? Am I saved? Can I be? Oh my goodness, I don't know. I'm always so worried. And you have not been living in peace. You've been living in fear. You're going, to, one of, I don't care who, but listen to me. If you listen to what we're about to teach with the word of God, not Mike's word, don't focus on me, focus on what's on screen. You can leave this live stream today in peace because we're going to talk about what true pre true peace comes from. And I want you to leave today saying, I am the blessed man whom God loves I, or woman and I can have peace. And we're going to know why. In Romans 3, I showed you that he was talking about divine forbearance and, 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 and God looking over previous sins. And he starts talking about Abraham. And then in chapter 4, he begins with saying, what then shall we say was gained? by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he would have some, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, let me give you a heads up of something that people do that I honestly think is disgusting. When you stand on this, you're gonna have people that say, well, James chapter two says, Abraham was not justified by faith. And they'll try and just drop that there and expect you to say, okay, and I'll, uh, I'll come listen to you over there. But that would be a contradiction. Ask them, how does that coincide with this? Because we could talk about that and we will if we have time. I want to get to that. I don't have time. I don't want to go into James right now and then come back. But what James is talking about has, I'll just give you a little heads up. If you read James, you can't read James 2 by itself and think it's talking about salvation. You got to read James 1, James 2, James 3, read the entire letter and watch the path that James takes and what he's really discussing. And, and in the entire letter, here's a heads up. It's like Proverbs. He's giving wisdom on how to be a light, how to be a follower of Christ. And everything he talks about is about your demonstration into the world, how you speak to people, how you treat people, how you show no partiality, how you don't uh, judge people and how you act as someone who also needs grace. And then he talks about our good works, just like John does in 1 John chapter 3. And he says, what purpose is it if you say you have faith, but don't do anything about it? He's not talking about what purpose is it for your salvation. He's talking about because of the context of this letter, he's talking about what good is it in the world? I could say I love Jesus all day long, but if I'm not loving people, what does it do to benefit anybody? Saying I love Jesus benefits nobody. It, and listen, I'm not, I'll say it right now. Saying I love Jesus benefits nobody. People walk by like, all right, cool. So what does he say? He said, show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. James is a faith person. He doesn't say, I'll show you my, uh, he doesn't say someone will say to me, I have works. He says, someone will say to me, I have faith because James is a faith person. And he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. Completely different. And he says, show you, not show God, I'll show you. So the justification that he then goes on to talk about is the justification before who? Man. James tells you this. He literally says, I'll show you my faith by my works, and then goes on to, was Abraham justified by his works? We know that his works made his faith complete. Because at the end of the day, why do we all trust Abraham? We trust Abraham because he took his son to the mountaintop and was willing to bring the knife down. So he was justified before you and me by his works. We now know he has faith, but God knew he had faith. So God justified him before that. That's why I listen even what Paul says. 
if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So let's keep going. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, there's two people here right now. You don't get a middle person. When we look at the cross, we see two thieves or two criminals, one to his right, one to his left. The one to his right said, I can do nothing. You, you, you deserve everything and I don't. And he was saved. The one on the other side was not like that. You can't play the middle because the middle is Christ. You're either the guy on his right or the guy on his left. Same thing here. To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. That's a very powerful statement. It doesn't just say believe, right? It says believes in him who justifies the ungodly. This is basically admitting that you are ungodly. So it's not just believing in this person. We believe that he is the one who saves us despite we don't deserve to be saved. And I've told y'all before, this word believe is such a powerful word in the Greek language. It's uh, pistos, I believe. And it says this, I believe with various constructions, I believe a person or a statement made by a person. And then here's my favorite part. I place repose my trust on either God or the Messiah. I rely on them. I commit my life to them. I believe in, I believe on, I cast myself upon them as stable and trustworthy with the energy of faith. So when we see that word believe, it's not just a thought in your head, right? Because again, James says, even the demons believe, but he's using believe in the sense of they believe God, God is one, yes. We believe in the one who justifies the ungodly. I think that's my dog or my wife or my son. My son, he'd be just banging the door, but hey, big boy. You're not on camera. I have the camera facing the other way. Can I be in here for until you're done? If you want to listen to me teach, but you can't talk. Oh, you want to sit on my lap? Okay, we're going to teach together. Um, shh, you gotta be quiet though. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And I want to stop here for a second and show you these two distinctions. When you do something out of love, we know the Bible teaches us that love is selfless. So the things I do are not for a wage, right? They're not for a wage. I do nothing for God to give. I'm not, here's one you can ask yourself. Would I, if God told me that I'm locked in for heaven, no matter what tomorrow is, would I continue to serve him and worship him? Or vice versa. What if he says you are condemned, you committed the unforgivable sin, would you continue to worship and serve him? Because here's the thing. The true love he's looking for is the love that would worship him despite him saving you. I actually would love to point out it this way. We, we talk about the uh, salvation being our inheritance, right? Let's go over to uh, Ephesians 1 real quick to kind of add on to what I'm teaching here. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Okay, that's not how we spell Ephesians, Mike. Let's go to Ephesians 1. And also, let's bring up, let's bring up, hold on, I got something in my head I want to bring up. Oh, what is it? <laughs> Hebrews 12. No, yes, and I want Romans 8. Ooh, y'all got, my, y'all got my mind spinning. Well, let's talk about something. Told you, y'all gonna leave here with no fear. I want you to know who you are in Christ. All right, here's what we're going to talk about. So first, let's understand what salvation is. Let's jump over to Ephesians 1 real quick. One section here I think we all should really, really, really remember is uh, right here. Ephesians 1 verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, remember that word believed we just talked about? You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So much power right here. When you believed, you were sealed. Let's look at that word sealed in the Greek. Seal and thus closed for guardianship or protection, the mark with the impress of a signet ring. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the king's signet ring on you. Can anybody, anybody understand anything about history, politics, kings? Can anybody lift that signet ring seal without suffering extreme punishment? We do not have the authority to unseal ourselves. Only he seals us. And we are sealed with the king's signet ring with the promised Holy Spirit, who is what? Who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Why would we receive an inheritance? This is why I love the scriptures. Let's jump to John chapter one, actually. John chapter one tells us something beautiful. Okay, that's not how you spell John. 
Let's jump to John 1 real quick. Why would you get an inheritance? I'll tell you why. Because people denied Jesus, right? But it says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, so your race doesn't matter, nor of the will of flesh, so your actions don't matter, nor of the will of man. Therefore, you can't think it, push it, make it happen. But of God, we become born again. We become adopted as children of God. Right? We know it's adoption because Romans 8 tells us what? You have uh, this, uh, blah, blah, blah. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Let me show you something cool. Hold on, guys. I'm opening up something I didn't plan on going to, but I think it'll be really interesting to show you this. All right, I'm going to bring this over here to you guys so you can see it. All right. So in the Roman Empire, that word adoption is really interesting. Okay. Let me show you. Um, in ancient Rome, adoption had a powerful meaning. When a child was born biologically, the parents had the option of disowning the child for a variety of reasons. The relationship, therefore, was not necessarily desired by the parent nor permanent. Not so, however, if the child was adopted. In, the Rome, in Rome, adopting a child meant, one, that child was freely chosen by the parents, desirable, desired by the parents. Two, that child would be a permanent part of the family. Parents couldn't disown a child they adopted. An adopted child received a new identity. Any prior commitments, responsibilities, and debts were erased. New rights and responsibilities were taken on. Also, in ancient Rome, the concept of inheritance was part of life, not something that began at death. Being adopted made someone an heir to their family, their father, joint shares in all the possessions and fully united to him. Him. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand how powerful that term is when the Bible tells these people during the time of the Roman Empire that you are adopted as sons of God? It means you cannot be disowned ever again because God chose you. It wasn't an accident. You were chosen. You can never be disowned. You have an inheritance and you belong to his family. All your previous debts are erased. You are his now. So ladies and gentlemen, if I work for someone, I, I earn a paycheck from them, Romans 4, right? But if, if that's my father, I have an inheritance. And guess what? I can come to the job and I can work all day long, but I'm not working for a paycheck. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That is my father. That's why we look in Hebrews 12. Uh, I brought it up because I think I brought it up. Ah, man, I bounced around a lot of stuff. Hebrews 12, what does it say? It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Your father in heaven, your life's not going to be super easy sometimes because he has to help you become a better man or a better woman. Sometimes he lets you go through something. But you're not alone just because it feels like it. There are plenty of times where as a father, I'm looking out my back window and I see my son doing something. And although I can go out there and make his life easier, I sit and I watch. And in the moment, yeah, he probably feels alone in the backyard trying to figure something out, but his father is watching him. And if he was truly in danger, I would immediately step outside. Likewise, your father in heaven is not leaving you alone, but he is watching you. Oh, dinner's almost ready. I got to finish up my teaching. All right, let's keep going. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks. I know I heard you five minutes. I'm trying to wrap it up. Love you. Um, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Then this is the section I want you to understand. Who, who is this person? Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. This is the righteous man that believes and is counted righteous, right? Well, if this is you and I, that means 
If I sin, he's not counting my sins. All my sins from yesterday are forgiven. There is no longer and no condemnation. I walk in his righteousness. And if this be the case, if you be the blessed man, this is what I want you to ask yourself. Let's read the beginning of Romans 5. Read it with me if you're, if you're watching. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that word peace? That is the word shalom, true peace. There is no peace in the Middle East, even when the war wasn't happening. You know why? Because at any moment war could break out. Imminent danger is no peace. If you believe at any moment you could lose your salvation, you, you cannot have peace. This right here is eternal security. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I can confirm that with John's words right here in 1 John chapter 4. If I scroll down a little bit, it might be chapter 5. Is it chapter 4? It's chapter 4. What does he say? So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Say that with me, confidence for the day of judgment. Don't let anybody doubt you, make you think, I, oh man, I might not be saved. We can have confidence for the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. How are we perfected in love? By fully knowing who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us. Because when you truly understand what he's done for us, there is no judgment. John chapter five, he tells us this very clearly right here. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but passes from death to life. And I'm, and I'm hoping that if you're watching this, you know that if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's nothing I can say to take that from you, your salvation. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you make, how wrong you are, because you're going to make those mistakes. You're going to be wrong. But if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what Mike says. It doesn't matter what the, your favorite TikToker says. It doesn't matter what your pastor says. It doesn't matter what your mama says, your father says, the Pope says. If you, we have been justified by Christ and you have faith in Christ, then you have peace with God because there is no fear in love, perfect love because fear is, is from punishment and we will not come into punishment because we belong to Christ. Anyone that sits here telling me you can lose your salvation, how could you have peace? That means you lay your head at night on your pillow praying, God, I hope I didn't mess up today. I hope I don't. I am his son. He has adopted me and he can never let me go. And God knows what he's doing. He didn't let the Holy Spirit use the word adoption at that time of, of, of humanity without them knowing what eternal, I mean, what adoption is. That's why it says you don't have a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of adoption to which you cry out, Abba, Father. My son can come in here right now and do the dumbest thing in the world. I'm not going to kick him out of my house. I love him. I hope this guys. I hope this helped you guys. You know, I would have went longer, but I actually got up here late, and I apologize for that. But um, uh, my wife cooked, and oh, it smelled good. You know, my wife been out of town for two weeks, <sighs> so I'm gonna go tear that up. And um, I love you guys to death. I hope that this has blessed anybody today. It was a short one, so I'll probably be able to download this one and put it on um, YouTube uh, for anybody that may have missed it. Um, but uh, remember what I recommended. Go read Galatians 2 and 3. Read Romans 4 and 5 and really soak those in. Read 1 John. If you struggle with your salvation, if you struggle knowing if I'm saved, go read 1 John, then read it again. And then on the third time, read it one more again. Because remember what it says in there. It says, if this be true, then you can have confidence. And it tells you what abiding in Christ is. Abiding is in Christ is keeping his commands. And his commands are what John says they are, not what everybody else says they are. It's loving the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul and loving your neighbor. If you love God, believe in the Son, and love your neighbor, you abide in Christ. And if you abide in Christ, then you abide in love. And if you abide in love, you have confidence for the day of judgment because you will not come into judgment because Jesus took your place already. Judgment is the stage with Pontius Pilate and Barabbas, but you're Barabbas in the end times. So either Jesus goes to the cross for you or you're on that stage alone and you go to the cross. I don't know about you guys, but Jesus already went to the cross for me. People try to put you back on that stage. People be literally watching Jesus on the cross and trying to tell you, go get on your cross now. People have the authority, I mean, the audacity to walk past Christ's cross. That's why people say, why you wear a crucifix? To remind these false teachers that he died already for me. 
I love you guys. I got to go. Y'all know I can keep going, but my wife's going to be like, get up. All right, guys, God bless you all. Let me pray for you all. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to have the ability to hop online and do a quick Bible study with people all over the world. And, and we had a lot of people in here tonight. And I'm praying that somebody gained peace tonight. And they're now talking to you saying, Father, I feel safe. And I hope that they are coming to you and, and, and just loving you and you can love them back. And if someone new was in here that never has been in here, that doesn't even know Jesus, I hope that today they got to know what a loving Father in heaven really is offering, not what these people say that he's offering, but what he really is offering, and that is peace and love and comfort. And I hope that they know that they can reach out to us and they can reach out and they can call on to you. And if they put their faith and trust in the fact that Jesus, who came in the flesh, died on the cross sinlessly for me, for us, and rose three days later is the gospel of our salvation. I pray that they put their faith in him right now. And I pray over all the body of Christ tonight that we may move forward and grow in strength and power and love. And may your grace be poured out on everybody. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, guys, when you get here to delay, let me know so I can close it out.